And so Norwich City's European travels have come to an end on pre-season. They ended here in Kufstein, Austria. And uh, this is your latest Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast to reflect on the trip. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll be able to see some of the scenery behind us, which we've, we've set up. We've got Kufstein train station in front of us, which is where we're catching a train in about half an hour time. Um, but we could not bring you a, a podcast in front of brilliant scenery. And there's some that side as well. This place is completely surrounded by mountains. Uh, I'm Connor Southport, joined by Adam Harvey and Paddy Davitt to speak about Norwich City's latest pre-season excursion, which obviously resulted in a game with Toulouse. They won that 2-0. It was split into three thirds. We'll get into all of that good stuff. We've got some questions from you guys as well. And I will just warn you, because we've got a train to catch, the second part of this podcast, again, probably only really applicable if you're watching it, uh, will likely be an audio-only version because it's quite hard for us to set up a tripod and, uh, and camera on a moving train, uh, which we're on for four hours. So we don't want to annoy people too much. So uh, yeah, that's that's likely to be how this podcast um, plays out. Paddy, let's um, let's let's come to you first. What, what have you made of Austria and the and the trip here? First and foremost, it seems like a an apt place to start. Yeah, well, I mean, we had the game on Tuesday. Today's Wednesday, isn't it? And uh, we had a final meal. Just reflected final on final supper. Well, I didn't want. Yeah, I was going to go that route, but I thought <laughs> I'd maybe don't want to offend anyone. But uh, and reflected on not just this trip, but Holland and also the week in Germany, which all three have been out there and, and you stitch them all together from our point of view. Yeah, it's been not without its challenges, some of the yeah. logistics. Um, if anybody's watching the vlogs, they'll know particularly the, the inbound from Holland. That was quite testing. Um, so fingers crossed we get a bit of luck today. We've got a four hour, as you say, four hour train to Vienna and then a two hour flight to Stansted. So um, hopefully we'll roll back into the fine city about half nine, is it? Just after that, I think about tennis, yeah. Tennis, right, OK, tennis UK. So um, so separating out the football element, which we'll get into, yeah, no, it's been good. It's been good. Uh, yeah, as I say, there's one or, t one or two issues, like getting locked in <laughs> at Kaiserslautern. That was a bit of an issue and getting in in the first place. Uh, working in a field, essentially, with no Wi-Fi, poor us, and no power, poor us, <laughs> uh, for the Alkmaar game at Dirkshon. Getting back from Dirkshon when there was no public transport, we needed to get a train. But So, yeah, now we could write probably a book about our experiences. But overall, how uh, can you not love being in places like this? You know, beautiful settings, and, um, and we're fortunate that we get to do it uh, covering Norwich City's build-up to the championship season. So... Yeah, all in all, from a personal point of view, yeah, I've done quite a few of these now, but this has been a good trip with one or two inevitable challenges. As you would, things never run smooth on these gigs. These new boys have had your first experience of it, so I'll throw it back to you. As your first experience of touring with Norwichman, I'll let Adam answer that first. Yeah, no, I've really enjoyed it. I say I've done one as a fan, uh, say four or five years ago now in Germany, and, and that was a great experience. Slightly different to this, probably have less memories of that one. Uh, due to the amount of certain beverages that were consumed. But um, yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. I've, like, Austria's a new country for me as well, so that's a plus. Um, love the scenery. In fact, yesterday on the vlog, I said I'd never been anywhere like it. And then my missus pulled me up last night and said, Lake Como in terms of the mountains and a lake is kind of similar. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there, there's some similarities there, but it's, this is very different. Obviously, it's been a lot of rain at different points. Uh, there was one point yesterday during the game, I was gonna take my jumper off because it was so warm. But uh, yeah, I've, I've you know loved the experience and, of course, it's probably just sort of piqued my interest a bit again back in Norwich and, and you know, sort of the season that's going. I think last year was certainly towards the end was quite difficult, obviously, for, for fans and even us covering it, you know, sort of going to every game and, you know, it's not not playing very well and results not going their way. But I think, you know, pre-season there's been some, some positive signs from the, you know, the way they're playing at the moment. Certainly yesterday, I thought the last 40 when Sarah's back in the squad and Fashion Act looked very good yesterday, which I'm sure we'll come on to. So, uh yeah, feeling more positive and looking forward to being back at Cow Road on Saturday, which is something uh, I probably haven't really said for, for a long while. Yeah, I'm going to miss not uh, looking at the mountains on, on Saturday when we, when we stood inside uh, Cow Road. But there we go. I mean, just to, to paint the picture for you even more, I mean, we stood essentially uh, a tripod is balancing on a wall at the moment and the other side of the wall is a, a platform for a train station we've got a police bay just to our right there is one police van parked in it uh, that might be in trouble if, if a second one does we've got uh, a car park bay and then just over my shoulder right at the top there yeah you may be able to see uh, what is like a white castle kind of thing on top of a uh, i don't know pad we got into this yesterday fort. Is, i think it's a fort. fort i've heard locals referring to it as the fort the fort we'd like to have gone up there but um 
as it was all business, we didn't get an opportunity, did we? So that's how hard we work, isn't it? You know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> food, food, and football. That's all we're interested in. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but this is this is quite an epic place because, the, as Adam hinted at, the weather changes so frequently, and uh, because of the mountains and the hills that kind of surround it, when the clouds come in, I mean, the rain pour can be pretty intense but really short and, and in really short bursts so uh, one minute I'll be stood here without a coat on the next I'll, I'll need like a, a thick winter jacket on it's been really bizarre but a really nice place uh, for Norwich City to conclude and for us to conclude our, our travels as well I think Norwich are here till Friday aren't they and then obviously they play Olympiacos on Saturday and of course we must say thank you to our, our sponsors Cavill Healthcare who have helped us uh, made all this possible essentially so thank you to them and of course uh, as we say there'll be an advert for them in the middle of the show but if you're looking for a job in care or you're looking for uh, the care of a loved one they are the, the place to go they do some great work in and around East Anglia. Um, let's move on to the, the football then we've got plenty to, to talk about obviously three quarters of, of football um, here in Austria we've got a new signing to discuss as well in Christian Fashnacht we can probably reflect on Bali Mumba a little bit in, in, in light of, of David Wagner's comments um, there's obviously the transfer stuff as well so so much that we're going to have to compress into a, a pretty short show. Um, Paddy, let's start with Toulouse and that game. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, we've spoken about this a lot, but I don't really like the games where they're separated into thirds or uh, quarters and feels like they go on forever and it's a bit of a marathon and it can be enduring. But actually, we, we were probably made to be patient yesterday, weren't we? Because Norwich City's best spell of football came in that, in that final third when they had Marcelino Nunez, Gabriel Sara, Christian Fashnak all on the pitch. Yeah, but I mean, and also, I mean, everything you say stands true. I mean, anything that's you're not going to apply context to it, are you? And, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what we're here for. But and anything that you know, you're getting into a hundredth minute, hundred and ten minutes. Uh, you know, unless it's an extra time of the FA Cup final or whatever, or the playoff final, then it doesn't do a lot, particularly in this setting pre-season. And also, I was just going to add that. I mean, we we're not close enough to the Toulouse set up. They had a lot of players there, a big squad, and we don't know respectively in their first three quarters I think their middle third it seemed to be their strongest or some of their better more established league earned players because they were even though Norwich probably in that middle third had the two of the better chances I think Sargent's chance and Gibbs put one wide more off more over that 40 minutes was was pretty much Norwich not having a lot of the ball most of the game compressed into the Norwich defensive half so Conversely, I think their final third, Toulouse made a few more changes and I'm not sure how strong they were. So, yeah, with that caveat, then, of course, yeah, it, you know, and it, that was the decisive element in terms of the result, wasn't it? And at the heart of that was brilliant Brazilian, Mr Zara, first appearance of the summer, one assist, one goal. Uh, and even better, maybe, you know, within 15 minutes of your debut, the new signing, um, showing his aerial power to connect with that Zara corner as well. And, and he had one, one other chance that he could have scored with, I remember. So... Yeah, of course. I mean, the takeaways are those two, but you know, the clean sheet and the win. Okay, good, positive, another little boost to the confidence. But um, you know, it means nothing in the bigger picture of Hull City and August the fifth at Car Road. But you know, David, when we spoke to him at length after the game, you spoke to Shane Duffy, and and you you sort of take your measure from what the mood that you, you you're sensing from those in the camp, and they, it all seems very positive and upbeat and. Optimistic, dare I say, um, but of course the proof Boys is in proof in the pudding is in just over two weeks from now, isn't it? When one Hall roll in, because as Adam touched on there, you know, Car Road has been a pretty desperate place. If you're a fan or us in the media or anybody connected with Norwich over the last, certainly last season, um, and that isn't going to be dispelled by um, beating Toulouse in, in beautiful surroundings here in Austria. So, um, yeah, you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll say. And we'll get into it, you know, positives, of course. Um, but also, as well, it's a little bit, you know, we won't know really, probably, definitively, until the whistle on uh, August the 5th. No, I remember when Norwich beat Marseille last summer. Was it 3-0? And I think Jordan Hugo scored a couple of goals. So yeah. uh, it just goes to show how difficult pre-season can be for, to judge. I would say you, you can take probably themes from it rather than any kind of overriding feelings. And they're probably ones that still you need to allow the season to develop further. For example... Throughout last preseason, we were talking about creativity issues. They, they sort of bled into the season, didn't they? And uh, defensive issues bled into the season. They were, they were all kind of visible in preseason. And you know, as much as maybe there, there's been lots of conversations about the lack of creativity, we had it in the in the Lion and Castle podcast with with Darren Eady. Thank you very much for for your support on that show as well, by the way. Um, 
they they have improved defensively. I mean, we we've only seen them concede what one goal and uh, across games in so obviously two games in, in in Germany, Alkmaar, which was where they conceded the goal, and that really came from Dimi Yanulis being caught out on the on the left hand side and maybe some questionable um, box defending thereafter. Uh, and then obviously they kept a clean sheet over three thirds. So I think we can tangibly say that defensively and structurally they're looking a better side, aren't they? Yeah, I think Shane Duffy's a big part of that. Uh, of course, we got a chat with him yesterday afternoon and you can kind of feel the leadership in him even just from from that you know and what sort of character he is in the building and you know he spoke about kind of you know his sort of a connection with someone like Andrew Omabama Daly who if he's still here you know he's got a sort of Irish idol almost to sort of idolise for, for the rest of well certainly at least till January um, and a player who will make him better a man who's played in the Premier League and he spoke about that sort of hunger and drive to get back there and I think those that kind of addition is exactly what Norwich City needed, certainly towards the end of last season when they lost Grant Hanley, who I thought was probably the one the one player in the defence that maybe, you know, helped them sort of well, ship not as many goals as what they would have done at certain points. So uh I think he's probably the ideal sign at the right time. Um and especially when they've got quite a quite a young, you know, back line in certain areas. You know, Kellen Fisher's a, a young player, he's looks like uh, he sort of caught the eye for David Wagner and again he's the kind of player who's gonna learn off someone like Jack Stacey. So I think the way they've done done their business in that defensive areas in this window has actually been you know, pretty shrewd, uh, a lot of experience, a lot of big, bigger, stronger players, which are probably what you need in the championship from a defensive sort of standpoint. And you can then maybe get away with it a little bit more in terms of having those sort of light, light, more lightweight wing, uh, wing backs. Because, uh, you know, if you've got a solid defensive partnership, then it can work. i um, still slightly concerned maybe that, you know, the sort of midfield mix might leave, leave the defence a little bit open at certain points. And, you know, some of the players that you know, sort of attacking areas in, in some of the strongest squads in the championship might have, you know, more of a field day against the Norwich defence. But of course, we won't know that until we until we kick off against Hull. So uh, yeah, but certainly from a structural point, they look a lot better side. And you know, David Wagner deserves some credit for that. Yeah, and it's it's interesting for all the conversations that we've had around the um, attacking side of it. Defensively and structurally, they are looking much better. We obviously spoke about the clean sheet record, and that has been a trend of David Wagner's coaching career. The teams that he has coached have been better defensively. I think he's even going back to his Borussia Dortmund 2 team, I think um, they only scored a few more goals than they conceded across 200 games there. Uh, he improved Schalke defensively for a period of time. Huddersfield obviously went up with a minus goal difference. So there, there are lots of signs to Norwich City following the trends, I guess, in, in that regard, which is interesting, Pad, because there's been so much discourse about defensive midfielders and centre-backs and uh, the way, I guess, Norwich City are going to move into the season now without what we would probably describe as a conventional defensive midfielder and Alex Tetti and Isaac Hayden, I guess, if you wanted to, to throw it forward. Uh, Ollie Skip, probably the best example of that. But actually, uh, have they proven in pre-season that if they can get the structure against the ball right, that actually they might not necessarily need one because of the way they're trying to play under it? That, but also Wagner's teams don't traditionally look yeah. at look where he's been. He doesn't have that, pick out his name again, Ollie Skip, star player. What he has is primarily like your double midfield pivot with its McLean, looks shoo-in, barring any injury or... It, any other issue between now and Hull, and it's who plays alongside him in that role. And then then those within that midfield structure are tasked with, essentially, you're not in there because I want you to screen in front of a back forward. No, you're in those positions of pitch because I want you to do that, but I also want you to be pro progressive when you're on the ball. I think there's, and I, we're still seeing it now, post you know what David said to us after the game about tr pretty much their transfers, slash, unless there's outs, is that, you still see Norwich fans disappointed that that means no defensive midfielder, but that was never on the agenda. It's not going to happen under this manager. That mindset has to be shifted and, and you have to view that area of the pitch in a more holistic way in terms of the demands he places on midfielders in that area of the pitch. And, you know, McLean, we're talking about Oli Skip as a template. No, Kenny McLean, I think, will be the template yeah. for what David Wagner wants there, which is he has that athleticism, that robustness that he can get around the park and he can do the defensive side. But on the ball, Particularly those long diagonals, which seems to be a feature of when we throw the conversation forward to how will Norwich penetrate teams or get in or around teams in the final third. You know, a lot of that seems to be shifting teams across and then diagonals to, to you know use the width, whether it's the two fullbacks pushing on or whether it's those wider midfielders. So, yeah, when we talk about centre mid, it's Kenny McLean style demands is what he's going to want. And, um, you know, as you say, his coaching career has been built on a defensively resolute platform so and that that one is the pertinent one for me to stat you quoted Huddersfield went up with a minus goal difference I mean that's that stat alone just tells you where he is as a coach and what he wants from his teams in terms of defensive structure 
and then within that subset, what he wants from his central midfielders. Yeah, and, and I said this in my verdict last night, but if you can do that and you can be more solid as a team and you can keep clean sheets more regularly and you can have that reliability on, on those defensive players. Shane Duffy, as you, as you mentioned, has made a massive impact since he's, he's come in. But I, I think actually just the overall structure of the team defensively has been a lot better. But if you can get that bit right, for all of the talk that there's been about creativity over pre-season, there's less emphasis for it, isn't there? Because it may it may only mean that you need a goal from a set piece or uh, you need a moment rather than three or four moments to score goals. So you can kind of see the logic behind, well, if they get one end of the pitch right, then the other might follow. But but also, I guess there's the, the, the standpoint that as confidence grows in that defensive line, you may well see the, the attacking element of, of things start to open up. And, you know, as Paddy said, we're yet to see a Norwich team really in this pre-season without Gabriel Sarra in it for a prolonged period of time beyond, obviously, the final third yesterday. And, and, and that was probably the best we've seen Norwich City creatively. Yeah, and I think as well, you know, now that Timo Pukki's gone, it gives Josh Sargent a chance to play the number nine role, which is something, you know, I think he's wanted ever since he arrived in the building. And you'd hope, you know, we, we saw evidence of it, certainly in the first half of last season, a man who can score goals at this level. And if he's got Zara and Nunes, who we both know have got you know ability to unlock defences in this league. You know, particularly now they've had another year of adaptation in the championship. I feel like they'll be stronger players this season as well. So I think I think there's certainly the tools there to create. Um, still got a few concerns, of course, even you know, fashion act. We don't know 100%, you know, how long it'll take him to get to grips with the championship. I mean, physically, he looks like the kind of player who will suit the league, but um, until, he, until he's played in it, you know, we, we don't really know. Um, you know, wide players, we've not really seen any tangible evidence of goals and assists from those positions yet in pre-season. I know, of course, it's difficult to take a gauge from that, but you'd certainly have hoped to have seen maybe the likes of, you know, Plahessa, John Rowe, Onel, more on the score sheet or providing assists in pre-season. So, a few concerns still, but... Um, I certainly feel, you know, certainly in the last 40 yesterday, I could see what, you know, there is some creativity in that squad. And I think, you know, certainly against some of the, well, as we saw the standard, the championship is generally weak, I thought, last season. And whether that will be a trend this season. But um, I think if Norwich can get those players on the ball, then they've got, they've got the players to score goals. And I think a lot of, you know, good sides in the championship do just grind out 1-0 wins. That's, that's, you know, often the way. I mean, Sheffield United last season, I yeah. didn't think were a particularly free-flowing goal score inside but they were effective at what they'd done and they were even like that under Chris Wilder so I think if David Wagner can get this you know that kind of output at this Norwich City side and it is just 1-0 wins it might not be the prettiest football but if it gets you back to the Premier League it can often be an effective way to stay there yeah and, and I, I don't really want to use his name to compare to but someone like Neil Warnock for example who's made who's a serial promotion winner I don't think we'd describe any of his teams really as being free-flowing they, they've come from a resolute defensive base which you know, I think you've, you, the championship has shown and you can look at some of the teams who've got in and around the playoffs in, in recent years. If you have a solid defensive base, you tend to get in and around the top six in the championship, whether you're good or whether you're not. So, um, maybe, well, maybe that's... Sorry to interject, well, Connor, but Luton were functional last season, didn't yeah. they? You know, they didn't have any spectacular players. What did they have up front? They had, as we all know, Carlton Morris and um, the player alongside him, who's the big lad up front? Adebayo. 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 So, I mean, you know, you wouldn't see either of those were... You know, particularly high-end strikers in terms of their skill sets, but um, within a, a system that is extracting the most from the available resource, which really, when you boil it down, is what any head coach is trying to achieve, isn't it? It's not, we must play in a certain style of way to get out of the division. You can do it Daniel Farker's way in 1819, or you can do it, as you say, the Luton way or the Sheffield United way. You know, even Burnley, I didn't think they, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were a hybrid. You know, they had good attacking players, and Ashley, and Ashley well. Barnes in that mix, but they were very solid defensively and they just had a good structure about them. Um, and I think that is, as Adam says, in a, a championship which feels, again, it's going to be dubious quality, patchy quality. There'll be, looks like Leicester will probably maybe be the Burnley of this coming season. But beyond that, I don't see anything that, that you would separate out from this group of Norwich players and say they can't, they can't strive if things come together. They couldn't strive to be as good as anything else in this division. Whether they will is obviously the, the million dollar question. Yeah, and, and for as much I think as we talked and we spoke about kind of the system being the, the creator in chief, so to speak, a couple of weeks ago, I think that probably applies to what they want to do defensively as well. I think they're relying on the structure and the system rather than, say, an Alex Tetti or, or a defensive midfielder to provide that security and, uh, and maybe stability and, and structure as well, I guess, from a defensive perspective. We're going to have to uh, wrap up the first part of this in a moment because we've got, we've got a train to, to catch. But um, 
uh, I did want to, I guess, speak about uh, the, the the final third a bit a bit more, Adam, because I think that that's probably where a lot of the positivity has, has come from. There was a lot of stodgy stuff, and, and I guess my my concern, if we want to lean into to some of the creative aspects of it, not necessarily when Norwich are away from home, or even necessarily when they're playing. Let's say the three that came down from the Premier League, where you know the the expectation is that they're going to have a lot of the ball, particularly say Southampton, because Norwich play them early on. They've got Russell Martin; they're going to have loads of possession. That feels like a game that will suit this Norwich team. For me, the kind of creative concerns come when you're at Carrow Road, you're faced with a low block, and you have to kind of unlock that. I think that that for me, that scenario increasingly is going around my head, and there's probably still a lot of red flags around that at this moment in time. I mean, is 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 that the same for you? You kind of mentioned a few concerns. Yeah, I think you know you look at that Rotherham game at home last season I think mm. that probably depict that exact situation um, and of course that was under David Wagner you know I think there was probably an argument that maybe Norwich didn't have the players to you know suit his system he's now brought in well seven if you want to include Reyes and Kellen Fisher in that uh, first team you know operators uh, different players and maybe a little bit more of a freshness and we can see by the, the fashion act sign and he's the kind of player that David Wagner's you know highlighted as a player he wanted to, to play his style of football and of course we saw you know the impact of that yesterday but um I do still have some concerns and I think that's probably where the fan base are at as well. You know, there's still, if you, you take a gauge of social media, I think there's still a demand maybe for some more wide players or an attacking midfielder kind of type where where maybe, you know, they can create those opportunities. And I think there's, there's still some fans, you know, got, well, I suppose, concerns about the fact that Norwich don't really have a proven goal scorer at the moment either. I mean, Josh Sargent obviously did get double figures last season. And, you know, I think you know, we saw he didn't... It's his best goal scoring season, wasn't it? Exactly. So I think he's the man who could be the one to, to build off. I mean, there's obviously not a lot of confidence in Adam Eder, but hopefully for his sake, you know, he can, you know, once he gets a goal, that confidence will come back and, you know, the fans will be back on his side and, and hopefully things will flow. But I think Ashley Barnes could be the key to it. You know, he's a... He's a player who could potentially rub off on those two, you know, a man who's been about the, the block and, and knows what it's about. So, you know, the only criticism of him is he's probably not a, a typical goal scorer. So, yeah, I do have concerns, certainly in those games against, you know, Rover and Plymouth at home where, you know, it's going to be gritty. They're going to come here just to play for a point and have Norwich got the, the quality to, to undo them. And they do, but whether or not they, you know, can, can extrapolate that is a different story. Yeah, it is. 27 minutes, I think, on the Ashley Barnes uh, booking uh, roulette yesterday, which is uh, which is great. How long is it going to be before you before you get suspended for for accumulating yellow five cards? The first hurdle. Yeah. So so what do you think? Five games? No, <laughs> no, no. We'll, no. we'll give him a bit of leeway. Uh, late early, um, October. I'll just go month October. I think we'll be missing him for a game or so in October. I mean. Yeah, I think yeah, I think you're, you're you're probably right. There there is a, a label that he was given at, at Burnley, and increasingly I can see why why he was given that, uh, which we we wouldn't dare to repeat on on this broadcast. Um, as we as we uh, head on onto the, onto the train in a moment, Pad, um, just your your kind of reflections because we've spoken to a lot of fans here, Germany, uh, the Netherlands as well. There isn't and hasn't been much optimism in in the air. I think that's fair to say, and you can take stock of social media as well. But we're getting that feedback to us as well as as, as online, which isn't always the best gauge to 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 find out general opinions of anything really. Um, do you having seen Every minute of Norwich City's pre-season, so not to put that on you, because I we, 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 well, us two have, certainly. Um, are, are you feeling more, I asked you this question a, a few weeks ago, more optimistic, less optimistic? How, how are you feeling heading into that, that, that final friendly? Yeah, you did. I'm trying to remember what I said. To I don't, be, I don't to think be you consistent. were particularly positive. No, well, I'd say I'm in a holding pattern now. That's, that's where it is, because what we said at the start of, the, of this podcast, that you can't really gauge uh, anything with any definitive statements because it is ostensibly minutes into legs, it's fitness, it's integrating those new players as well um, and trying to gel that while working on structures in and out of possession, lots of double sessions, has been triple sessions, they've been phased out now. So there's too many intangibles at this stage to then say, right, this is going to be a 10 out of 10 season or a 1 out of 10 season for Norwich. Um, I, I still, at this stage, as I've maintained through the summer, if you were to push me on where I think this team are going to finish, I'd say it's in that six to ten bracket in the table. But of course, it's very fine margins. You know, my team, Coventry, they started, they had those issues with the stadium. They couldn't play some home games at the start of last season. They came to Norwich in September. They got beat 3-0. Norwich went top. Coventry were rock bottom and they were points adrift. Second half of the season, Mark Robbins has got them going. Jokeresh and Hamer came together as an attacking two. They went all the way to the playoff final and lost on a penalty kick. So... 
that underlines the folly of really nailing nailing down where we feel this is going. But I, I think there's enough. I think what I would say on, to keep it on a positive uplifting note is that there's there's there is enough evidence starting to emerge. I don't think they'll finish 13th. I think they will be better than that. I don't think they'll tail off in that sort of unendingly miserable, prolonged post Millwall. Um, downturn that we had to all endure last season I, I don't see this group of players in similar circumstances you know almost just sort of raising their hands and we can't stop this we can't arrest this this slide not with a Barnes not with a you know uh, a Duffy maybe even Fastnack I think he's got that sort of strong personality so yeah I think I think it feels it's moving in a positive direction but how quickly and how prolonged you know, who knows, until we get into the, the real business, which is three points at stakes, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, we're not going to know, are we? Because, you know, it's not only Norwich, we don't know really, we, we don't have a sense of what the other clubs are doing and who's going to come out the back and maybe surprise us all, because inevitably there will be, because there is every year in the championship. So, yeah, I'm still probably just taking taking stock of where things are and, um, and you know, probably you're only really going to be able to, to start to see how this season's going to unfold, maybe a month in. Maybe They always say, don't they, 10 games, that cliche. Don't even look at the table until 10 games are in. So, you know, maybe we'll, we'll stick to that mantra, although we all know it's like after the first game, if Norwich win 5 nil, top of the table, here we go. <laughs> Indeed, uh, and here we go, and here we go as well. We've got to, we've got to catch a train now. So that's, uh, that brings nicely the, the end of the... The, the first part of the pod in, in beautiful Kufstein as we say goodbye to, to that. Uh, we're going to leave you with a message from our, uh, our sponsors, Cavill Healthcare, and uh, we'll be back after this short break. Caring for others is the greatest privilege that we could have. If we couldn't do that, then I think we'd be in the wrong profession. It's a job that when you start, you never want to leave and you can go home knowing that you've made a difference to someone else at night. That means a visit by someone. As I say, they're, they're not my carers, they're my friends. It's just so rewarding to go home and know that just because I've been there for a little while, I've made a difference to their life and made an impact. Welcome back to uh, part two of the podcast, which takes us on to the, what's this, the 1053 service to uh, Vienna train station, but we're going to have to change at Vienna main station to the back end of the train in order to get to the train station. But some, uh, obviously, as I said in the first part of the show, this will be an audio only just for the, uh, just not really convenient for us to whip out a camera in these places but I wish we could because uh, just outside the train window as I look to the left we've got some epic views of, of mountains and, and just unbelievable scenery I mean this is a, a really beautiful part of the world that we, we find ourselves in and uh, obviously this I think about half an hour from where, where we were based in the first part of the pod is where Norwich City have been training so this has been their backdrop all week which is uh, it's quite remarkable especially when you come from Norfolk and there's no hills so that's uh, that's been good um, Paddy let's uh, let's talk about uh, the transfer element of things then Norwich obviously uh, officially signed Christian Fashnak on Tuesday uh, he joined the I think he joined Pierre Lace Malou in, in, in scoring on the same day that he was unveiled as a, as a Norwich player and a pre-season friendly so we hope he's uh, infinitely more successful than, than Lace Malou was but you uh, there, but, uh, yeah, you gonna have that way yeah, you stopped my line there but I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry, um, but one. let's um, let's let's talk about him, and I guess we can wrap him into a wider discussion and conversation about Norwich City's transfer activity. I think we've said on this podcast numerous times uh, before we get misquoted or, or however else that um, that it would probably be a winger, and then that would be your lot, dependent on on outgoings. I actually think that's probably really specifically depending on the outgoing of Andrew Mabamadeli, because you know are they going to add another winger if Milo Rashica goes? Probably not. They've got uh, Jack Stacey and Kellen Fisher, who by the way. I'm, I'm absolutely uh, uh, raving about. I think he's he's he's, been, he's had a brilliant pre-season. So um, Christian Fashnak first and, uh, and foremost. What do you make of, of that addition? It's one that sort of popped up over the over the weekend. I mean, we, we kind of had word last week that they were maybe getting a bit closer to a winger. That then seemed to cool by the end of the week before it exploded into life again over the weekend. So what what, what do you make of this guy? 29 years old. Obviously signed from from young boys in Switzerland, brilliant pedigree in the, in the Swiss league, over 200 appearances. What, what do you make of the signing? Well, I mean, 
with the greatest of respect to Norwich, but this is Norwich who finished 13th in the Championship. You think, how have they got this going? Because his pedigree is everything you've mapped out. He's still in his 20s. I think he's 30 in November, but in football in terms, it's still relatively young. He's certainly in very good nick physically. I mean, anybody who watched the, the, the clubs behind the scenes or first day where he went through all the various checks and medical tests, uh, there, was a, there was an amusing... Uh, passage where he was you know his joints were being looked at and uh, in rude health I think was to paraphrase so that won't be lost on certain more cynical uh, City fans who, who've seen a lot of signings come in and uh, maybe not been in the peakest of physical conditioning when they first walked through the door of recent times but yeah no uh, pedigree wise profile wise age wise it's physical uh, conditioning um and you know the fact that you know he knows David Wagner he knows what he's all about there isn't going to be that adaptation period yes he's going to have to understand you know what's in the squad in terms of his teammates and David flippantly said after the game on Tuesday you know he's, he, he played that last 40 he didn't know a lot of his teammates names that hadn't trained with them because of the the prolonged nature of getting all the, the medical side and the, the contractual side sorted out on the Monday Sunday Monday plus the travel, um, which he's had to do more of. It would appear he's had to go back to London, as we record, uh, for visa requirements, to then come back out to Austria for two days to go back to England. It's uh, quite the hectic. So to, to in the middle of that, to, to come on the pitch and actually um, give a little glimpse of what he might offer in terms of goal-scoring threat, on set pieces particularly, um, it's hard, it's hard to, to just keep things on the low-low because it does strike me as a player who I don't think Norwich would have been able to attract him maybe if it wasn't for the David Wagner factor he and David have both talked about that their relationship and, and that's been a key driver in this um, I do have a question mark why you know he hasn't tried his luck outside of Switzerland before now you know he, there was talk he could have gone four or five years ago talk even last summer um, but he clearly feels the time is right now um, to try his luck in England and uh, yeah it's Early days, Adam made a point in the first part that until we see him in the white heat of a championship game, then um, you know, best to reserve definitive judgment. But uh, I would say that's on the face of it as good a piece of business as they could do at this stage for where they are as a club with the finances they've got to play with. Yeah, and I think he had 12 months left on his deal. It sounds like the fee was somewhere between one and, and, and two million euros, which I think equates to about one. If you if you put a marker slap bang in the middle of that, it's about 1.3 million pounds for a player of of his pedigree. is uh, is, is pretty good going. Um, his uh, fun fact is his last name translates to carnival in English. So hopefully we'll uh, we'll be having a few carnivals uh, in the championship next season. And Adam, he was uh, he spoke to Tim Closer in, uh, in in deciding this move. So. The big question on everyone's lips, will he end up with a house in Dis? I've not checked the property market in Dis, to be fair, in the recent days, but I can imagine there's probably a few about, so uh, I'm sure if he's got Tim Closer on uh, on his dial list, then uh, yeah, I'm sure he can sort him out. Um, but there's plenty of other nice places in Norfolk to live, so uh, I'm sure he isn't going to have a problem uh, finding somewhere nice to live. What, what did you make of his first cameo? Obviously marked it with a goal, which is the best way to introduce yourself to any um, any new club, really, and it was a, a really well-worked headed goal. I had to climb quite high above the defender. I don't think you're convinced by the goalkeeping, Paddy, but I thought it was a, I thought it, I thought it was a decent header. Um, what did you make of his cameo, though? Because even though he, he scored one, he probably could have had two others at least. Yeah, it slightly threw me actually because I was looking out for the number 16 shirt and then it was 33. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think I spoke about it yesterday morning because I was looking at like his goal record and I think you're, you, you did actually. Yeah, yeah and I, I said he he's got a record of scoring headers and uh, yeah, there there he is at the at the post heading it in for um, Norwich's opener yesterday against Toulouse and uh, yeah, I, I thought physically he looks like the kind of player who's going to adapt to the championship nicely, which is something I thought maybe of, of Norwich wingers currently in the, in the team a little bit lightweight certain you know Jollis not exactly the biggest lad Rowe not exactly the biggest lad Plaheta not the biggest lad this this guy looks quite big um, physically and I could see that yesterday you know certainly to, to rise up you know like he did it for the corner and you know, I think Norwich that's probably been a criticism at different points set pieces they've generally been pretty poor um, across you know the, probably the last two or three seasons in the championship even in sort of the successes under Daniel they didn't exactly score many corners and this guy looks like the kind of man who you know if you get a corner in the 90th minute has got that height and you know they can sort of tower above others and 
and find the you know the space he needs to, to head home. And I say he's got a goal record. You know, I think it's, is it uh, he scored over over ten goals in every season apart from two. Uh, yeah, I watched right. part of your your interview yesterday uh, with with the guy who's uh, you know an expert in Swiss football, which is well worth a listen uh, or watch on our YouTube channel if uh, you want to get some proper insight on the lad. But um, yeah, certainly from what we saw in the brief cameo. Um, of course, as I say, I'm going to reserve judgment until until Hull, but. Um, you know, because I've been been excited before about certain players in pre-season, it's not panned out in the way we'd all hope. So, but yeah, I, I've got a, a gut instinct that this could be a, a really good bit of business. And for 1.3 million, a bit of bit of experience, a man who's played in you know Euros and Champions Leagues, you know, they're, they're, you don't find many of them in the Championship. So that could be a you know a pretty invalu invaluable uh, asset for Norwich to have on the books. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it might have been NCFC numbers. I might pull this up when you're when you're speaking, Pat. But I'm pretty sure there's only three players who have played in World Cup finals and the Champions League to have played for Norwich. Certainly recently, I know Thomas Helveg was one I saw on the list. The song, yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to get that up now uh, to find out exactly what that was. But uh, yeah, Pat, Norwich have, have lost the Pookie party, but they might have a Christian carnival. Um, so that's, so that's good. But let's uh, let's let's uh, wrap this into a, a wider conversation about. Their, their transfer visit. Here you go, I'll read it now. Permanent Norwich City signings to have previously played in uh, both the World Cup Finals and the Champions League. Thomas Helweg, Sebastian Besson, Christian Fashnak. So it's quite a, uh, an extensive list. Um, so yeah, that's that's interesting. Certainly uh, backs up his, his pedigree. But yeah, let's let's chat about Norwich's business more widely because as, as we said, that David Wagner was pretty conclusive, I thought, last night in terms of there will be no more business unless, I think, as we mapped out, um, on, unless, basically, unless on Mubamba Delhi leaves, I think that's that's essentially where we are with it. Um, you know, for, for the reasons that we discussed at right back, Jack Stacey, Kellen Fisher, uh, is certainly making a hell of an impression at, at right back, and it feels like he's going to be able to, to deputise, and they, they feel he's ready to deputise. And then in wide areas, they've, they've got options coming out of their ears, so it doesn't necessarily feel like they need to do another one if, if Milo Rashica, who hasn't been involved last season throughout pre season, we saw him yesterday with, uh, with a hood over his head looking. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe not best, please, but I, again, I don't want to interpret that as, as, as anything it shouldn't be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, is, is that how you see it? If, if Omar Bamadeli leaves, that would be the only thing that would force Norwich City back into the market at this stage, but I guess alongside any potentially really bad injuries. Absolutely, and that's more or less what we've been saying for however many pods. Is it? Well, it is, <laughs> definitively. Go, go and have a listen if you, if you doubt us, but... Uh, he, I think, I think what what sparked maybe a negative reaction in certain quarters again. You know, social media isn't probably the most definitive constituency to to pin an, a collective Norwich view of the world on. But uh, but David's finality when he spoke to us after the game on Tuesday that that is it. Bar probably on Obama Delhi is an out. He didn't specifically say on Obama Delhi, but but from what we're led to believe, they got a target list ready to go if that transpired that they needed another centre back, which they would do, because they don't have Grant Hanley, they don't have Jonathan Tompkinson for the foreseeable. Um, you could not go into a season with Duffy and Gibson, both dubious injury records, or in Duffy's case, certainly not played a lot of football competitively in the last two or three seasons. Uh, and then young Jaden Warner in around it. Jacob Sorensen has got these groin issues. He's not even really a factor in that that equation. So, oh, Hanley. yeah, we said Hanley. Yeah. yeah. So, for me, I, I think it's more that, that David has has come out and and the finality of what he said. But actually, that's essentially the position that they've they've been in, um, probably post Borja signs really. That they just maybe with his injury they needed to do uh, one in wide areas but even then we were led to believe even with science as an addition they were still looking to do something yeah. in wide areas so they've been pretty consistent you know you can overlay again the Weber post season round of interviews where in various outlets it was five to seven well in terms of numbers they've hit that if you include Reyes and, and Fisher which certainly Fisher you have to now in terms of the senior signings 80% or so of the business done by Germany. Well, it was it was pretty much that, really. They've only added Fashnak since. So I think there's been a consistency in, in what Norwich have been looking to do, and, and it shouldn't really come as a huge surprise, albeit I can see it, I can, feel, I can, I can understand it entirely because... It's interpretation, isn't it? It's, well, what, it's the way those words have been interpreted by, by some fans, number of changes. I think David Wagner alluded to it as well. I think maybe the feeling that... This, the scale of the change was perhaps going to be a little bit more significant than it was. Is that where where some fans are? Do you, well, do you no, think? No. well, well, that might be. You know, that might be the case. But for me, it was. You know, you had the the twin track kind of vibe that on one level was those 
messages from Weber which were pretty clear in terms of what they were looking to do and the volume of the, what they were looking to do and so you should know that that's that's one track but then the, there's always and it kind of bleeds into this we need a central defensive midfielder we need another forward we need another wide whatever it's kind of the, the coming down Christmas day and open wrapping a present you didn't expect and uh, you, you're, you're overjoyed and the anticipation and the excitement of that I think there was still even though you're told quite clearly by the people who are framing this this window from Norwich's perspective it's going to be five to seven it's going to be 80 percent of the business done by Germany there's still clearly that hope that oh yeah but they, you know they might they might be able to pull a rabbit out of a hat to, to coin that phrase and and more or less David has now closed that down as an as, a, as an avenue that they would be looking to do and it's very much they said it was going to be that and it has been that and there shouldn't really be a huge amount of disappointment. Certainly, there shouldn't be any surprise that David has come out. I mean, maybe he was too honest for his own good there. Maybe he could have left it hanging in the air that they'd still be on the lookout. And of course, they are. This is the thing where they may well have been done, but things can change. Oh, Bama Daily can go. They can get an injury between now and the end of the window. The end of the window is until September the 1st. They'll have played a number of games by then. Whole City, you could pick up a serious injury on the opening day. They'd have to react to that. There will be maybe players younger players who by the start of the season they're clearly not going to be part of it they need to go out on loan that's all part of doing business ins and outs you know this this idea that we're in we, we move through a transfer window and you're whatever the fixed point is there is how it will end is very very naive and unrealistic because things happen events change they've still got the loan options inward you know there might be something that present that isn't there now but in two or three weeks time particularly with Premier League loans clubs make decisions on players right at the back end of the window in terms of loaning younger players out there may be a hypothetically a Marquinhos style situation that presents itself um, if you go back to January he was only available once Arsenal got knocked out of the third round of the FA Cup I think from memory um, that might be the case again it, and, and there might be something that David and, and Stuart think well actually that that might be something that we, we could bring in and, and, and of course it's a loan so there's no major financial outlay in six months twelve months whatever so for me, it, it, I don't understand the negative reaction to the comments. He's basically mapped out or reiterated, is a better word, where Stewart said that we're going to go at the start of the summer and that barring those out, slash Oban Babadeli, or barring unforeseen circumstances injury-related, um, they, will, they will be reacting. And, of course, they have to do their, their work. That, that's why they've drawn up a target list for potential Oban Babadeli replacement, because they can't be left... At the eleventh hour, where Omar Bamba Daly hypothetically moves on, and uh, and they're scrambling around trying to find a replacement. So, so the work is always constantly ongoing. It's an evolutionary process, you know, in terms of the scouting, the recruitment, drawing up target lists. That doesn't mean they press buttons on all of these, but they're constantly because if they wasn't, then they, you know, there would be the anomaly in, in in top level football because every club is doing that. Every club's recruitment department is constantly, um, you know, it's not a finite. We're working to one window. They work windows in advance. We know this. We've heard this before from Stuart Webber. So, for me, um, not quite sure why there's been such a negative reaction. David Wagner has merely underlined what Stuart Webber said at the start of the summer, and that now, as it stands, he doesn't feel they will be looking to do any more further additions. But you know, anybody who, who thinks that's that's an about turn or a U turn, or they've, they've suddenly whipped the carpet from from what they or the rug from what they promised. Um, I don't see that at all, but you know, people want to jump on quotes or, or fragments of tweets and make their own conclusions. That's up to them. But uh, I think you, you strip out the fact from the fiction, and um, and they're basically where they were going to be, according to Stuart Webber. So, you know, whether that's good enough in terms of have they is a different debate or a different part of that debate. Have they dramatically overhauled the squad? Are they dramatically going to be better than they were last season? Have they addressed the deficiencies? None of that we will know until we get into the championship season so maybe reserve judgment on how good or bad the recruitment has been until we get you know a good portion of the way into the season yeah you, you said it there and I go back to that that interview I think he gave it in, it was in his round of media and it, I think it was to ITV Anglia uh, and he did say five to seven which is what Norwich have, uh, have done uh, either end if you want to include the five senior editions or if you want to throw Reyes and, and, and Fisher in there as well which uh, certainly with Fisher I think you, you would have to now given his uh, his performances in in pre-season and I think I think Pat's right there Adam and I think it is 
I guess this bleeds into a bit of the feeling that was there last season where there was so much frustration and, and apathy and uh, well obviously parts of the, the fan base were, were feeling um, apathetic, others were, were angry and frustrated. I guess it's, it's that scale of change, isn't it? There, there will, or there's always people who want to see more, right? And, and that, that is the case, particularly around transfer windows. But it, it will be the case that maybe these people feel, and, and these fans feel, that they were expecting more, they felt that more was needed. But actually, in the financial constraints that Norwich are operating, and they still haven't sold anyone really for, for any kind of money beyond Bali Mumba. Um, it was always going to be very difficult to, as it would have been anyway, say, right, 13 players, we're going to, we're going to chuck you to the side and we're going to bring in 13 in. Very, very difficult. Do you understand why some fans are, are feeling frustrated with, I guess, what Wagner said in terms of the finality of, nope, that's us done, unless, you know, as, what Paddy mapped out there, certain events popping up? Yeah, I think when you're not happy with something, you, you know, the, the, your, your gut instinct is just, just to rip it up and, and start again. And I think that's easier said than done, of course. You know, if, you, if you're playing FIFA or football manager, you can do that. But it, it, in the reality of, you know, a transfer window and, and real life, Norwich City can't just, you know, sell everyone. It's, it's, that's not going to happen. They, you know, they need tangible interest from players. They need contract situations to go in their favour. You know, all these situations to, to fall into place. So that's, that's not possible. But I think... You know, there's a lot of players in this squad that maybe last season underperformed that can, you know, this season come back stronger and hopefully perform to a, a higher level. I mean, I kind of go back to that first season under Farke, you know, Vrancic and Tribal. None of them, you could see glimpses in them, but there wasn't exactly a, you know, a sort of consistent nature to their to their play. And I think there's probably players in this Norwich squad that have got that sort of similar similar feel to them. I think, you know, we saw the sort of best of Sarah towards the end of last season, but I think there's certainly more to come from that man. I think Nunes in pre-season has been, you know, probably a little bit under the radar in how well he's been performing. So I think there's certainly more to come from him as well. So I think they can almost be like new signings as, as well. You know, a lot of these younger players, John Rowe coming back, of course, you know, Wagner's already spoke about that one as almost being like another new signing, a man who was injured for, for so much of last season. And, you know, Kellen Fisher could be a, a star that's maybe, you know, because he's sort of a was originally, I suppose, brought in and seen as a you know future sort of a development player, an academy player, and he's you know done so well. I think probably a lot of people aren't putting him in that sort of senior signing bracket, but yeah, you've definitely got to now because he's you know certainly going to be in that squad. I think for the whole game, maybe not in the, you know a starting position, but certainly on the bench. So I can understand the frustrations. I get the frustrations, and I think you know you look at it, and I think Norwich have you know in the past maybe not you know replaced the, the sort of natural defensive midfielder position but as we've already spoke about in the first half of this podcast you know that's just not a, you know a player that David Wagner is going to want and you've just got to accept that and move on um, but yeah of course a lot depends on what goes out the door now I think if Andrew on Daly does leave of course they're going to do another centre back we know there's some targets already you know on their list at, at Colney and you know they'll be quick to move to sanction someone to, to fill that void but um yeah, I get it, but I think yeah, once it gets to the whole game and, and hopefully you know Norwich can get a positive result, maybe that kind of mindset and mentality of the fans will change, and you know they'll maybe get on board with, with what they've done, and hopefully the business they've done has been uh, you know successful for once. Yeah, I mean for me it's it's like well why why would you bring in a defensive midfield? We know how Wagner's going to play. He's going to play with that double pivot. Why would you sign a, a an Isaac Hayden type? You know that, that I'm not saying him specifically, but that type of player when he's not going to get much minutes. It's a waste of time. You've got plenty of midfield options that are more likely to play. Liam Gibbs, um, Nunez. You, you mentioned you're blocking you're blocking pathways for for these guys. The centre back issue. If you want Jaden Warner to push through, if you want Jonathan Tomkinson to push through, and actually signing another centre back at this stage, you're blocking people's developmental path. Uh, again, if, if Wagner is happy with, with Duffy, Gibson and Omar Medelli as the trio, with Grant Hanley to come back as well, suddenly you're talking six centre-backs in the building when, when they all get fit. That's that's a short-term view on it and long-term would be a bit more problematic. So I think there's there's a bit of, uh, I think some of, the, some of it, and understandably, is quite emotive, um, what we're seeing at the moment. And, you know, after what happened last year, it is that desire, as you said, to just rip everything up and start again. But it's, it's never as easy and, and as straightforward as that. You're going to have to keep some players, right? So um, that, 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 that is the nature. One player, Paddy, who won't be here, obviously, Barley Mumba. We spoke about him a little bit on, the, on, on our previous podcast, but that was uh, pre-David Wagner's quotes last night. It was kind of in the middle of it all going through. I think in the first part, it hadn't quite gone through, and then the second part, had gone through so we can probably have a bit more of a reflective conversation about it here um, from David Wagner's comments I mean it 
seems to stack up, doesn't it? And it, I mean, we said this. I think it might have been the the chaotic pod in in Frankfurt, but it's hard to argue that Barley Mumble was ahead of where Kellen Fisher was based on what we'd seen in pre-season so far. No, David was very very good on on this topic, and and it it, it is a two-part thing again. It is Mumba maybe not being quite the right fit, um, whereas Fisher very much seems to be, um, and a surprising one at that because. Good, hasn't he? Yeah, but, Dave, but David more or less intimate. Well, he did. He was quite clear in his post match. Go and watch that on the Binken channel. Um, that had Max Aarons not been away with the 21s over the summer, um, Kellen Fisher would have been off in Slovenia with the with the 21s recently. You know, he was very much signed as a development initially signing. But David said, "Well, we've got a spot. Um, let's bring this guy with us. Let's have a look at him." And um, and he's he's picked up the mantle and uh, and ran headlong with it and uh, as David said last night look at the strides he's made in four or five weeks what could he now do in the months ahead if he continues on that trajectory and um, and I think that was ultimately the deciding factor allied to Barley Mumba's desire to move on um, which David revealed to us and uh, and also I think the positional thing the element of, of, of key importance here in this conversation is that Barley Mumba sees himself as a wing back. He communicated that as much to David. That's where he played for Plymouth. That's where he was good enough to be League One Young Player of the Year and a League One title winner. And, uh, and now he's a Championship player with Plymouth. Good luck to him. But you know, his first game back last Saturday for Forest Green against Forest Green in a friendly, he's playing left hand side on a, an attacking three. Well, he's not going to be that for Norwich. He's not going to be a wing back for Norwich because David Wagner is, as we discussed in the first part, defensively his structure is back four and it's full backs, and. Uh, and I think we have to be honest Barley hasn't shown enough in the early parts of pre-season in that position um, to feel that he's ahead of Fisher but that he could be a longer term successor to Stacey slash Aarons and uh, you know after the Kings Lynn game when I asked David about Barley it was more or less he's got a lot of things to learn in his game and, and maybe that was the first signal that okay well you know maybe this isn't quite going to work in the here and now but yeah so I think I think the logic there from David is, is sound, and as he said, in answer to well, why didn't you loan him? You know, again, why do you have to actually sell him? Well, I guess there's a financial element to that. We've discussed Fastnack and what he's cost, and it's, it's probably not a coincidence that the number goes and one comes no, in. No, right? no, no. So, uh, given the financial constraints they're under, so there's that argument. But also, as David said, or it might have been somebody else actually. You know, I think about it. I spoke to about this yesterday inside the club that. You go away and put him out on loan, but he doesn't have quite a, or anywhere near as successful a, a time on loan this time around. Does his value, market value, increase? Um, probably not. So you, you, you know, and, and there'll be attendant clauses in that if he does go on, and which was, uh, you know, part of the strand of why have you sold him when when it was all went came to, came out uh, quite quite suddenly on fr last Friday. You know, why have you sold a player who could go on to be? But don't. Um, there's no way Stuart Webber will have sold him without you know. Madison-esque scale uplifts if he does catch. Now that will obviously open another debate about well, you know, look what he's gone on to achieve. Why couldn't we incorporate him at Norwich? But in the here and now, you're dealing with a head coach who he doesn't fit the template of what that head coach wants. So he doesn't feel he's going to use him this season. Barley made it quite clear he doesn't really want to be here. That he wants to move on. If there was an opportunity to go back to Plymouth, and uh, and as I say, underpinning it all is. Um, another young player who is making the sort of noises on the pitch that would lead you to think that he might be actually a better mid to longer term solution than Barley Mumba in that position of the field for Norwich so yeah I think I think you could kind of see where Norwich's thinking was at when the news came out but now we've had David clearly mapping out what the strategy was there I I'd be surprised if there's any Norwich fan who would, would take issue with that in the round you know including the Fisher dimension as well Absolutely, yeah, and I think it's 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 difficult. And I said this at the time. I think it's more what uh, Mumba represents rather than than him himself and, and and the player that he is. And I think you know you you could make an argument. And look, sometimes players need moves as well. I guess Carl Morris is maybe a good example of that. Someone who, at the, when they were at Norwich at that stage of their career, needed to go away, needed to go and play, needed to to go somewhere where they could succeed. And uh, obviously, he's done that. And there's no reason why Barley Mumba can, can't do the same. But that doesn't mean that. The decision was wrong initially, you know. So it's it's it can be quite a, a difficult one with with a nuanced one as well with with, with plenty of um, yeah multifaceted, I guess. So it's going to be interesting to see how he how he goes. <laughs> I know that Norwich fans will be watching his uh, watching his progression 
with interest. Right, let's move on and, and let's finish with some uh, with some social media questions. Thank you to everyone who has uh, who has sent them in. Um, we've had some some good ones this week. We're going to start with uh, Ian Capelli, who has asked two questions. I'm not sure if he's allowed to, but we'll give him to. Uh, I'm going to throw this over to you. Uh, well, I'll get both of the, get both of you actually because it's a general question. Uh, and the first question is, what's your starting eleven for Hull, Adam Harvey? Well, that's a good question. Uh, as we sit here right now, uh, gunning goal, Stacey, Duffy, Gibson, Yanulis, Gibbs, McLean, uh, Sarah, uh, we'll go on the wings, we'll go Pas uh, Fasnak and Rowe and Sergeant up top. No Ashley Barnes? No, I think uh, for Hull at home, I want to see an attacking, attacking side and uh, yeah, I'll give Liam gives it a go. Interesting, played 120 minutes by the way, I bet his legs are sore today. Paddy, you're starting 11 for Hull as we sit here today with what, a week or so to go? Yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't disagree with Adam there, but if I'm, if I'm, if I'm putting myself in David Wagner's shoes then I think... You've got the cap on. Well, yeah, thanks. Yeah, Dallas Cowboys giving it a, giving it a rock. I, I think he will go Barnes, and I think he won't. I think he'd take Gibbs out of that equation. So, Sarah in alongside McLean, Fastnack on the right, Rose slash Hernandez. Yeah, I can see that on the left. And then I think because we, what the evidence is pretty compelling now that he likes Barnes and Sargent in that two, they lead the press out of possession as well. The structure that they afford Norwich, you can question maybe does it have the layered dimensions attacking wise, but. I think that's how he'll go, subject to no issues, obviously, injury-wise between now and then. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I actually think Norwich have looked better when they haven't played the two strikers. I think they've, they've, they've looked better, and again, going back to the Toulouse game last night, they looked a bit better when they had Nunez in that in that deep position, because if not, you find Josh Sargent coming to, to the edge of his own area, trying to get the ball. It's not really the area of the pitch you want him to be in, but uh, again, maybe some, some ways that can be ironed out. And then his second question, which is much more pressing, uh, favourite biscuit, Paddy? Well, when you asked me this earlier, I said all of them. But uh, if you had to put me on the spot, Jammy Dodger, I think. Quite partial to a dun Jammy Dodger. Are you, are you a dunker, you know, in, in tea? Um, no, not really, no. Too many accidents, that route, isn't there? You know, it's not a good vibe to be fishing a soggy biscuit out of a cup of tea. So, no, I tend to err on the side of caution on that one. Go on, throw that back to you. What's your favourite? Oh, I'm a custard cream man, oh, course, I must yeah. say. Yeah, I love, it. love a custard a cream, as you, as, you, as, you know, as you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, very much a dunker as well. But, to be honest, quite quite um, favourable to most biscuits, to be completely honest. Adam, favourite biscuit? Uh, this is very brand-specific, but uh, M&S Dutch Shortcake, which is, uh, which is a basically a shortbread biscuit with chocolate on one. It's a very Viennese, Viennese uh swirl kind of based it's got chocolate right. on one end short bread on the other uh, so if m and want to send me some you know free to post for some free promo then uh, I'm very open to that does it have to be M&S you can't, you can't get them anywhere to be else. fair I've never seen them anywhere else I've never actually gone looking for them because uh, yeah this has been about four or five Christmases ago I got bought bought some and because uh, I'm quite partial to a shortbread and yeah, ever since then, like if I'm ever in the city and uh, there's none in the cupboard, then uh, M&S is a, a swift, a swift trip of mine to, to go pick some up. We won't pass judgment on your use of M&S, so it's, it's all right. Uh, Leo's Seabreeze has asked uh, new new players: who are the ones to watch, and uh, who are the ones that will score a few? Well, on, on the early evidence, Fastnack, I think I didn't, I wasn't aware of that stat that he's gone double figures at bar one season, bar two, bar two yeah different league I know adaptation required I know but he just I mean, as David said he's a type of winger they don't have in terms of you know he, he almost thinks like a like a centre forward when the ball's on the opposite side and the the winger's about to put it in he gets himself he doesn't need to be told or coached to get in there he just had an, an eight sense and, and it wasn't just a goal from a set piece there was another two or three opportunities where balls came in from the left hand side he's actually on the move near post runs getting strikes away so in answer to who's going to weigh in with some goals out of the individuals who've come through the door, then I think he would be top of my list. Yeah. Which signing have you been most impressed with so far? Um, I'd say I'd say Shane Duffy. To be fair, um, I wasn't at the Kings Lynn game, so I obviously missed his uh, slight clamming. Cracking header. But uh, yeah, generally, I think certainly in these games overseas, I've 
I thought again yesterday his sort of leadership you know in terms of you can hear him vocally on the pitch and what he can bring you know from a well one leadership point which I made earlier in the pod and and two just certainly you know he's got the experience of playing in this this division which I think certainly when you're coming up against big physical strikers he's the kind of man who knows how to deal with them Um, but I'd I'd give Ashley Barnes a shout out as well because I I was obviously taking photos for us yesterday and even in that last uh, third where he wasn't playing his, you know, vocally from the side of the pitch, he's, he's telling Christos Jolis where he needs to be, and I think that kind of, you know, person around the group is only going to rub off well on, you know, those younger players. And I think we've already heard from the noises inside the club. You know, he's a character off the pitch as well, and someone that the players are really warm into, and also, you know, those staff members as well. So. I think he also deserves a shout out, certainly for those reasons. And uh, yeah, of course, the, the you know the, the proof is in the pudding, and we'll uh, find out which ones uh, you know have been successful in uh, just a, a matter of uh, weeks now. Talk to us about his initiation song, Pad, because it was it was quite something, wasn't it? From what we what we gather. Yeah, Neil Adams was telling me it was you had to be there to, to view it. Yeah, the Wurzels, he's from the West Country, and uh, I think they're. Uh, he wanted to be a farmer, didn't he? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, they're an old school band, but uh, they're very much West Country uh, vibe in terms of their musical uh, bent. So go and maybe go and look them up on YouTube or whatever, or Spotify or whatever. But uh, something about a combine harvester, I think. So God knows what I have done. I let me think of a player. God knows what Gabby Zara made of that when he's still on his chair at their uh, beautiful Kaiser Lodge base. I'm assuming it was in, in Austria they've done that. Neil was saying. Um, he didn't name him, he said there was a support member who did one 12 months ago and it literally, it was a bit, um, what was that, Britain's Got Talent, uh, Boyle woman, what was her Susan name? Susan Boyle. Yeah, when she opened her mouth and it was like, out came this beautiful sound. It, it, apparently there, there was a very very similar vibe and they were all agog. He said he basically said it goes one or two ways. They After about 30 seconds, if they're any good, then the players join in. Oh yeah, you know, like David Moyes, and uh, I would walk 500 miles after West Ham's Europa League, <laughs> or or it goes the other way and they get howled to derision and get off the chair and sit back down again. I don't actually know which way it went with Barnes, but as Adam rightly says, I doubt anybody be booing him, so he probably got a fulsome round of applause. He'll be all right here, won't he? If he likes combine harvesters, that's for sure. In uh, in North. I, just had a, I, just, uh, I think I'm pre- uh, sorry, Neil. If this, I think in the same conversation he said Zara, Zara did uh, the Macarena. So apparently that was a right toe turner, and the whole group were up for that. So you can imagine Grant Hanley doing, you know, the backing vocals <laughs> on that. There's an image. What would be your choice? Initiation oh, song. God what are you choosing? Oh well, I, I don't have the best of voices, so it'd have to be. I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to. You have to come back to me on that. I'll go to Adam then. If you've got a choice, for initiation song. What would you go? For? Uh, go for a bit of the YMCA. I think I can imagine. Uh, you, you, you young, crowd, yeah, you younger boys would uh, enjoy the. Uh, would enjoy that vibe. And uh, yeah, my my voice isn't great, so uh, I won't. I won't put you through that. What <laughs> you got? I don't know. You probably get you. You want something that people know, don't you? So I'd, I'd be inclined to go for a Wonderwall or something, something like that. To be honest, yeah, yeah. and absolutely butcher it in the process. But uh, well, seeing as I saw him twice uh, this summer, I'd have to go with a boss. I think pick out a Bruce Springsteen song. Born, born in the NNN, something like that. Yeah, Ad- adapted. Yeah, that works. That yeah, works. Yeah. You get uh, you get Josh Sargent up for that one. That's uh, that's for sure. Of course. Uh, let's let's uh, finish with a final question. And we've had so many, so sorry if we've missed them. Some of them I haven't selected because we've kind of touched upon some of the topics. Uh, others just uh, sadly pressed for time a little bit. Uh, Yeller is his name. Um, that's yellow, but with an A instead of an O W. So uh, I'm guessing that's a, a Norfolk. Yellow one uh, and uh, they ask Sara and Nunez clearly provide the creative spark uh, we need but how do we fit them both into the same team Adam what's your 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 answer to that probably playing I just wait have to drop out a Barnes in a number 10 role probably and uh, switch it for Nunez and play Sara and McLean as the, as the double pivot I think that's probably the only way you can do that but you know given the sort of relationship and the you know I suppose the the love that David Wagner's got for for Barnes and Sargent at the moment as a as a duo, it seems difficult to to see that being the, the situation. Certainly in the early games in you know in this campaign, where I think he'll probably go with with his gut and uh, yeah, I think it it's probably one of them where Nunez might have to bide his time, come off the bench, and hopefully create a little bit of magic later on in the game. Yes, indeed. That probably uh, probably wraps us up nicely. I think we're 20 minutes away from from Salzburg, so we might be able to see. Uh, RB Salzburg's ground on the horizon at, at some stage. Paddy, final word to, to you. I mean, as we sign off from our European travels, um, 
yeah, let's have your, your final reflections as we head back to the UK on, on life and on Norwich City. <laughs> life. Um, I can't wait to get home, I've got to be honest. I think I've had my fill. As anybody who watched the first vlog of airport <laughs> lounges, we won't be doing one of them. Do you, you want to clarify you're a morning person? Well, you've got no choice in the matter when you've got a three-year-old who has a capacity for waking up but between 5.30 and 6 a.m. Yeah, there's, uh, there's not a lot of choice in the matter. So, yeah, no, I... I don't have an issue getting up in the mornings. I just have an issue of being sat endlessly in airport lounges, as lucky as we are. But um, no, on a serious note, I think I'll just round off where you started. A big shout out to Cabell Healthcare for their support and uh, sponsorship of the tour and uh, tours plural. Um, and hopefully, you know, everybody who's who's consumed any of our content across any platforms have enjoyed it and stick with us as we get into the serious business because we, we will be there home and away every press conference pre and post match all, all through the season trying to bring you as close as we can and um, ask some of the questions you'd like to ask you might not always like the answers or you might not always like us and our content but uh, ask the tough questions but if we wasn't here I think you'd no, I think you'd notice so um, you know basically keep supporting the, the brand and um, let's all hope for a good season yeah, and that's uh, that's why we do it as well, isn't it? Um, for, for for the guys out there, and to, to try and bring you a little bit closer to, to your football club. And if you have enjoyed it, then please do consider going to our website, taking out a subscription, uh, and, uh, and following us for the new season. As Pad says, we'll be there. Uh, come rain, shine, Austria, Hull, Rotherham, we'll be there, uh, and uh, we'll bring you everything we can to do with uh, to do with Norwich City. So, from the uh, the beautiful scenery of Austria, we head back to Norfolk. It's Olympiacos on Saturday. Looking forward to. to to being back at Cowra Road, uh, albeit in not quite as scenic conditions, but uh, the fine city is uh, is absolutely lovely. And we will uh, we'll see you again on the next podcast. Thank you very much for listening, be it today or across the summer in the pre-season tour. And uh, yeah, let the real stuff commence. See you soon. <laughs>